first time we meet each other, but it's really a pleasure to to meet you. I know your community a little bit uh, back in the uh, early 90s. Uh, I had friends who lived right above your shoulder on the screen on Coquina, and I, I remember visiting uh, your city. Of course, we know it uh, for many things, uh, including that's where Channel 7 is located, and it's right in the center of our, you know, right in the center of, of our beautiful Biscayne Bay. So it's really, it's really a pleasure to talk to you. There's, um, there's an informal conversation. I'm Xavier Cortada. I'm an artist and professor of practice at the University of Miami, and I'm doing this project just as a way of capturing the voices in real time of how we're dealing with our community. And I, I think your, I think your community is, uh, you know, a particularly important one to talk about this because everyone lives in such close proximity in condos. And although you're in charge of government for the municipality, each condo has its own governance. And I kind of wanted to sort of touch base a little bit on on that. What's life like? I mean, I. The friend I visited was in you know beautiful home in Coquina, but I think most of your is it six or seven thousand residents around. We that have room? almost nine, probably a little over nine thousand now. Yeah, so most yeah. of your residents live in condos. So just want to have a little general conversation about that, or anything you want to talk about, as a way of seeing where we are with the pandemic, you know, um, and how we could improve it. But first of all, uh, greetings. Uh, I know you have a, a really wonderful. Uh, a CV that we'll be putting at the bottom of this interview, your work uh, abroad. You know, thank you so much for for your service. Uh, you know, in helping West Africa and uh, and the Caribbean uh, nations through your consulting work, uh, through helping small businesses. So people get to, to to read a little bit about that. But I just want to engage in an informal conversation. So again, welcome and, and thanks for talking to me. Um, how has the pandemic impacted you personally? Well, you know, I I think personally. It, it's it's been a it's been a difficult ride, you know, for everyone. I, I I think you know if you if you observe one thing about this pandemic, with very few exceptions around the world, certainly across our country and locally here in Miami Dade, it's made the vast majority of people substantially worse off than they were just a few months ago, and so that's going to have implications and ramifications in the daily lives of everyone because it it affects our interactions with people around us. And yeah, you know, this I think morning, uh, on CNN, there was a survey, 13%, uh, one three of Americans are feeling uh, satisfied just with life, with our nation, yeah. with not even a political conversation, just 13% of us feel satisfied. That number was at its all time, well, not all time, but 15 year high at the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. So we are, we took a serious, serious, just like our GDP did, just our personal sense of how things are took that. And again, uh, go ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I want to give you a little statistic to, to vouch for exactly. No, that, that's, that's interesting. And, and I'll use that. Um, you know, I think that, so, you know, for, first from a personal level, you know, and then, and then from a professional level as, as mayor of, of yeah. a city, you know, on a personal level, yeah, I, I feel actually very blessed, you know, as I, as I always have, because the pandemic has, has obviously changed my life, you know, in, in major ways. And yet I'm not threatened and my family's not threatened in terms of our food supply. We have stable housing. You know, we're blessed in North Bay Village to be surrounded by the water in a beautiful natural surrounding. Um, and, and so I have absolutely nothing to complain about personally. Um, in fact, it, there are many positive things, you know, th there are more negative things that have come to me personally from this, but there are many positive things as well to, to help offset those a little bit. And so I, I have nothing to complain about. Um, and I, I, but, but many, many people do, you know, many, many people have, have, and not, it's not even a complaint, you know, they're, they're faced with essentially an existential crisis economically. Uh, and other, you know, even even in terms of food security, and you know, you you noted some of my work around the world, you know, in, in past years, and I've worked with, uh, you know, I've worked with with extremely impoverished populations around the world. Yeah, I was I, I was in I, Sierra Leone in '94, so I I know where you were. I know uh, the work uh, the work that you did. So it's yeah, just, it's it's you know, and that that was a that was a building experience. But I I you know, I told my my wife who also works in in nonprofits, uh, you know, lifetime of work in nonprofits. And, you know, I never expected to come back to a place like North Bay Village and be dealing with week to week food insecurity. You know, and as soon as the pandemic was on, we already started with food giveaways and, and food lines. And it's just not something 
you ever would have expected to deal with in governance in North Bay Village. Uh, you know, and we've we've managed to pivot to trying to take care of these needs, but there are many, many reasons why our country is not set up to deal with this type of crisis. And, and I think that is that that is most obvious and most painful at the local level of governance where where we are at the municipality level. And we just, you know, we are not set up to deal with people's day-to-day -day subsist, uh, subsistence needs. Uh, local governments were never set up for that. And so we deal with governments at a, at a different level to try to help us out. And then, you know, you can get into a discussion about whether that's happening or not, you know, and you try to stay out of the politics of it at the local level. But we simply do not have the resources to deal with a lot of this stuff. And the buck has been passed all the way down to the local level to deal with it. And so here we are, you know, it's, we're, we're caught in a, in a, between a rock and a hard place, essentially. Yeah, no, I've spoken to other mayors across Miami-Dade County, uh, state senators, uh, every major candidate for uh, the uh, county government's uh, mayoral job. So um, there's a lot of what you're saying that does does resonate. And I do, I do hear a lot about how broken things are, particularly across layers of government, but also within. And I, I do want to have that exploration with you. I think it's an important conversation. The reason I aside from talking to scientists and, and, and non-political community leaders, I do insist on speaking to community um, elected officials because in so many ways, that's a pandemic of this scale requires governmental intervention that has to, I mean, the, the way you, you either, um, you know, uh, put a curfew or determine whether people wear masks or how resources are allocated, uh, how to invest in uh, protective equipment or vaccines or treatment. These are all governmental functions. These are not business or individual functions. So I do, I do, I don't shy away from talking about uh, governance, whether it's politics or, or, or the administration of the big, bureaucracy itself, the job as a CEO of a nation or the CEO of a state or the CEO of a county or village. So we can have that conversation. I also want to dive in a little deeper just in, in, in your, your neighbors and specifically how, how, you know, what's come of this. And, and it's a free flowing conversation. You know, I just want you to um, do what you just did. You know, if you, if you want to connect experiences of what you've seen in other places and uh, what some similarities or, or some, <laughs> glaring, uh, let's just call it absurdity of, of what we're dealing with now, how, how they're, you know, food scarcity in the heart of Biscayne Bay, in, a, in, a, in an environment where prior to, I don't, I don't know if they're, I don't know what the level of poverty is. I know there's municipalities in Miami that have poverty. I'm not sure that your village is, is one of the higher ranking. Well, well listen, you know, because we're a, a coastal community, I think people often expect us to be sort of on the upper end of the, you know, the median income or the, 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 the income levels of, of Miami-Dade. And, you know, we're, certain, we're certainly not struggling with food security in general or housing security. But, uh, you know, at the same time, North Bay Village is a community that is uh, middle income, largely middle income, uh, although somewhat, uh, you know, we do have certainly a, a spectrum, but, uh, you know, they're, they're, we're, so we're also- Retirees too, I'm sure, right? Retirees, people that have fixed incomes? Well, no, you know, people, no. people think that, but, you know, a lot of the older population, you know, has, has moved on. North Bay Village, the demographic of North Bay Village is largely, it's largely a bedroom community for the service industry on, on the beach and, and in see. Miami. And, you know, we do obviously have outliers because we have a, a diverse housing stock. So we have large single family homes on the waterfront. But then, as you mentioned, we have a lot of condominiums. And by some measures, we're the densest city in the entire United States in terms of population per square square mile, so to speak. You know, North Bay yeah. Village is only a little, a little over, a, a little under a half square mile of dry land. Uh, and we have almost 10,000 people here. So when you when you suss out the uh, the density per per square mile, we're as dense as it comes, uh, and that has ramifications in a situation like this, as as you mentioned. Now we have done a great job keeping the the levels of infection and of COVID low, and I think that's also an interesting case study because you know we're a residential community, um, and and people have been careful. The level of education is relatively high. Uh, when you see people walking on the streets, they're keeping their space, they're maintaining social distancing, and they're wearing masks to the parks. Uh, and we've only had, 
uh, you know, a, a handful of cases of COVID in North Bay Village, in all of North Bay Village, which I think is, is pretty remarkable. I mean, last count, I think we were at 14, um, which, is, which is pretty remarkable. That's so cases as opposed to infections, right? You mean people who were hospitalized? Is that what you mean by cases? Or? Diagnosed cases of, of positive, positive COVID results. So, and, and you know, there's, there's obviously some, some discussion to be had about how these cases are registered and, and the like, but that's in terms of people going in to take a test, uh, giving their information and saying, I live in North Bay Village. Uh, again, I think at last count we were at like 14. Uh, positive cases, which is extremely low. It does uh, sound really low. It on. does. If you mean if you mean testing positive for the virus, you mm -hmm. have fourteen cases. Then, whatever you're doing, let's bottle it. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. It, it, so it's so that that's great, right? But at the same time, there's not a lot of transparency into the figures and the numbers. And so, uh, you know, one thing that we noticed from the start with the reporting of numbers was that you had very high rates of infection around, for example, in the zip code or around, for example, where Miami Mount Sinai Hospital is on Miami Beach or around where Hialeah you know, Hospital is out in Hialeah. And so it looks to me like some of the cases are being positive, you know, simply being reported as where the hospital is um, or, or the like. I don't think there's an extreme uh, concentration of infections in, on, on Mid Beach, you know, in a residential neighborhood, but you've got the hospital there. So it's really hard to tell you know, we have calls constantly with the, the, the DOH, you know, Florida. Um, but I think a lot of these numbers it, it can be interpreted different ways and are being reported in different ways. And it's tough to get a grasp on exactly what's uh, what, what's what. When everyone is so intent on these numbers uh, and learning from them and trying to figure out how to enact policy or even whether or not to close a business, uh, uh, it's, it's really disturbing. I have been since day one uh, trying to document every death in Miami-Dade County. And, you know, the numbers are all over the map, as there are the infections. Um, and, you know, when they get reported, how they get reported, whether uh, the cause of death is really properly ascribed to COVID-19 or did they miss a COVID-19 case and called it a coronary, um, you know, heart attack or, or, or something else is is all in dispute. And that, that, is, that is a problem when we're trying to be an evidence-based society. Uh, when so, so many of the facts feel uh, as if, if, I don't want to say manipulated, but just for whatever reason. Uh, well, look, let, I mean, let's, let's call a spade a spade. They, they are manipulated. You know, you can see the president on, on television manipulating the data, you know, explicitly manipulating the data. So, you know, I, I'm not saying one way or another that things are better or worse than they seem, but I, I can tell you that there's no real way to tell, which yeah. didn't, it didn't used to be the way that we went about things in the United States, you know, by trying to manipulate reality. But certainly that has been our experience over the, over the last few years. Yeah, I do, I, I agree with you. And I think to our detriment, to our, to our societal detriment, so much of this uh, was preventable. And of course, I don't need to tell you, you um, as mayor, uh, complied um, and promulgated regulations that closed down your residential areas. I was just on your website looking at the things you're trying to do to get businesses to open by having extra signs and stuff like that. But literally the time when we closed down here in the county at the end of March um, uh, was time where we we're supposed to do contact tracing. Uh, we're mm -hmm. supposed to get our, our act together in making sure that we contain this virus. And now it feels as if it's out of control. And I'm just well, wondering look, if you had any, know, any people, on that. people say that, that hindsight is 2020, but I mean, it didn't require hindsight. I think everyone was saying at the time, okay, we, we've shut down. Now here are the things we need to accomplish in this interval. And no work was done on accomplishing any of those things. Uh, and, and so, you know, it's, it's very easy to figure out what the issue is. I mean, I, I, at a local level, you know, in North Bay Village, we have a $20 million budget. We don't have a lot of wiggle room one way or the other. We're, we're not going to have extensive testing and contact tracing in this city. It's just not something that a local government is equipped to work out. But if you look at the county level and they, you know, they even now have for, for the last month or six weeks, almost half a billion dollars in CARES funding, which was passed along to the county from the state, you know, that, that money has only resulted in a very minimal contract, contact tracing program. Uh, and, you know, the testing has certainly improved. But you know we're not. I think we're not where we need to be on the contact tracing. 
And we're still not where we need to be in terms of individual citizens, by and large, taking, taking the initiative and protecting themselves and their families from this. Although I do think that things are very slowly improving in that regard. You know, I, I, it's comparable in a way to climate change, you know, except that the pandemic happens more quickly, right? So climate change is a, is a debate that's very germane to North Bay Village, at, you know, we're, we're three islands at sea level, but it's a debate that we have about how much do we need to do? What is our personal responsibility to act on this? You know, who's responsible for what? The pandemic is similar in that I think over the, over the first months, you were seeing a lot of argument about, you know, what can government make me do? What are my individual liberties? But what it's really gonna come down to in the end, and this is, you know, you talk about local government, we can't have, we can't assign a police officer to follow around each citizen and make sure they do what they're supposed to do. In the end, it comes down to personal responsibility. And I think that people are starting to understand what is the correlation between the way they act and how quickly their, fa you know, how safe their family is and how quickly as a society can we overcome this. And the more, the more people get that over time, you know, the better things will gradually get. So yeah, you know, the, that's where we are. My hope is that that, that um, behavior uh, extends to not directly protect the family, but also to protect the broader community, to indirectly protect the family, right? The same thing with sea level rise. It, you know, it's too. all part, it's all, you know, they're all layers of the same onion, right? Right, they really are. At, 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 and in so many ways, I think that this polarized nation that we have uh, um, has forgotten, you know, the community. I know we're fiercely individualistic as a, as a nation, uh, but we sort of forgot the communal uh, necessity uh, as biological beings that need to, engage uh, uh, in practices that preserve ecology because we are biological beings and B, um, as, as citizens of a nation, a nation is nothing more than a series of social contracts with one another for the greater good. And I, I just, to this day, the people who still resist um, the simplest of things like just wearing a mask and making a political statement by not wearing one really astound me and I, I just don't know what the answer to that is do, do you have you had to fight well, look, that I, you know I, I, it, it comes down to, to psychology right social psychology but the you know the issue is that a relatively large percentage of the the, the US population has been convinced uh, you know if we if we let's just make a pie argument right the, a relatively large pie, percent of the population has been convinced that the size of the pie is fixed. And the only way that they can get more is to take from someone else. And so that's where all this individual liberty argument comes from. And, you know, there's a political philosophy, you know, that really identifies with one of our two parties, which I happen to be a member of, where you just try to make the pie bigger for everyone and everyone gets more pie. You know, that's where I come from, right? So, but, but you get into these ridiculous societal arguments, you know, where people are more intent on taking pie away from other people and you just can't convince them that, hey, let's make the pie bigger. So, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's not a good outcome, but, you know, depending on how philosophical you want to dig into it, I mean, it all comes back to education. It really does. You know, and here we are defunding our public education system, you know, as quickly as we're, as we're doing anything in the United States. So, you know, if we, if we want to fix this, we got to invest in schools, in public schools. You know, that's really the easiest way. But we've been decades without doing that, and it's always sort of under the radar, you know. So that that would and, be my solution, you know, yeah. invest in public schools. The um, how how's your how are your condo uh, uh, associations managing this? I'm sure that I am so sure that you get emails every day from residents feeling that they're either doing too much or not doing enough, and and I think unlike many other mayors, I had no idea you were one of the most densest. Uh, cities in the US. But I'd, I'd love to get just for the for, you know, for, for this conversation for the archives of how you know, Miami went through through Corona, if you could just go into that level. So I, I live in I live out in the suburbs. So there isn't a lot of um, interaction, you know, I, I actually Facebook my 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 dear neighbor across the street, because uh, both of us are really uh, 
trying to stay in place. So there's really a more distance here, but people who have to use a trash chute every day or have to come in through a communal lobby or be in an elevator, they're more engaged. And of course, you know, condos are, you know, the lobby is, everyone owns it, the common areas everyone owns. So there's, there's this governance that happens in there. And there's all sorts of personality and political things. We, we know the horror stories. I'm just wondering if you have anything to share uh, with us uh, about the good, uh, the indifference or the bad, both in the governed or the people who govern those associations that might bring, that might enlighten us a little bit in how, how people respond to crises like this. No, I mean, it's impossible. You, you can't do it, you, you know, because like you mentioned at the beginning, I mean, each condo association is essentially a mini, you know, a mini empire. And, and so you, you can't, as a city, make rules for condo associations, you know, as, and even when you do, you know, to enforce them is very, very difficult because now you're talking about micro enforcement, you know, and you can't, you can't stage a police officer in the lobby or at the pool of every condo to make sure that, uh, that people are, are following what's best for, for, for the community. And then you get into these, you know, these micro situations or microaggressions where one or two people decide that they're, you know, that they're mavericks or the rules simply don't apply to them, uh, you know, and then they get very aggressive and, you know, people tend to call the police or what have you. But, you know, again, until people ha can figure this out for themselves on a, on a large level, that here's what I need to do to protect myself and the community. You know, it's I'm protecting myself, my family, and I'm, I, you know, because people seem to, to take offense to the idea of protecting the community, right? As cer certain people don't want to protect the community, you know, because it's, it's slightly inconvenient for them. You know, they forget the part about protecting themselves and protecting their families. You can make it a purely selfish argument, but you do. You, just, you still have people out there that, that don't want to go along with it. Uh, and, and you can't, you know, we just don't have the resources at the city level or at a level to chase people around and make them be intelligent. You know, you can't do that. So I, I don't have a solution. And sure, we get tons of calls, you know, enforce this or make a mask rule. But the more rules you make, the more people around, you know, the, that sometimes making rules, you know, in this environment incentivizes people to behave worse than they did before because they explicitly want to break the rule that you made, you know, or you, you know, your mayor or the city doesn't have the authority to do this or that. And, you know, we could have these legal arguments all day too, you know, under an emergency situation, it's not, it's not, it's not completely crystal clear and it hasn't been litigated, you know, what you can make people do and what you can't make people do. So you try to suggest to them, here's the thing that I would like. And, you know, I, as, as progressive as I am in a lot of things, I don't like to make a lot of rules for people you know, in the city, because I don't think that making rules helps. All it really does is give us more th more problems because you get people calling this guy's breaking the rules. You need to convince people to do the right thing. You know, if you can't convince them to do the right thing because it's good for them and good for everyone, you can make all the rules you want, you know, you're still going to have trouble with it. So, you know, what, we're what we focus on is, is trying to message what's best. You have some wonderful people representing you at, um, at the state level and in, in the county commission. Um, how, how, has, uh, how has working as a village, uh, as a city mayor with your uh, state delegation and with, um, with your commissioner, Sally Heyman, how has, that, how has you know, their advocacy for you as a city worked? Where have the pitfalls been? within those two systems, uh, just from a, from a village point of view, where, where are you? What did you wish you and they could have accomplished for your community? And what well, we, do we have, forward? you know, at the state level, we have, uh, we have excellent representation. We have obviously Michael, Michael Creek, our state representative and, and Jason Pizzo, our state senator. And those two work, I think, as hard as any elected official state could possibly work for their, you know, for their constituents. And, you know, we had, both of them working on, on small business help, both of them working on, especially on unemployment, which is, you know, squarely a state issue. Yeah. Yep. I think we're- As is health, as is health for the record. I mean, the Department of Health is, uh, is a state department. These are, and that's where a lot of this transparency and lack of tracing is uh, emanating uh, or not. Yeah. Coming. But go ahead, I'm those, sorry. Those, I, two, I, those two have done a great job on what they can. I mean, they can't go to Tallahassee and force the, the you know, the legislature to convene and, and do their job, but they, you know, they can help individual constituents. And, you know, I know that it, the constituents probably feel as close to those two as they've ever felt to their state senator, or their state representative, 
you know, going back some time. They, they've both done a, a tremendous job uh, and, and I'm sure will continue because they're, you know, they're in public service to help people. And so here's your opportunity to do that. Um, you know, at, at the county level, it, our relationship with Sally Heyman is great, but the relationship with the county is very complicated right now. It, you know, and, and certainly we could dig down into what the issue is, but I can tell you that of the $474 million of CARES Act funding, that that went to the county to support Miami-Dade County residents, you know, so far we've seen, you know, I I would be surprised if we've seen more than a few hundred dollars come to North Bay Village. The uh, you know, argument is that the money is being spread to all residents, including yours. What do you say to right, that? Well, if, they, if that's the case, then, you know, because I made a public records request to the county last week saying, okay, you know, give me the figures, how much money has been spent in North Bay Village. Obviously I haven't heard anything, but I can also count. You know, I can count and I can tell you that of the programs that they've set up, if we go through and look at the programs they've set up, those programs are not what my residents are asking for. My residents are asking essentially for, for two things. You know, they're, they're asking for assistance on rent and, and, and getting by day to day because their jobs have been suspended. And, and I have small businesses asking for support. You know, how do we stay in business? And the county, you know, the county put together a very small rent program, which was like a lottery. I mean, it's just, it's just political posturing is all it is when you put a little bit of money into a pot and then you make people go through, jump through these bureaucratic hoops and they never hear anything back, you know, it makes the situation worse rather than better, you know, and in, as far as the small business support, you know, that, that has been a bureaucratic behemoth that we're still trying to figure out how to even get our businesses to apply. You know, I was, I was pestering poor Sally Heyman in her office for, for weeks just to get the link t so my business can apply for the money. You know, they just set it up yesterday after weeks of, of waiting. So they said the county finally got their act together, set up the link. You know, who knows what happens next? I guess we'll find out. You know, all our businesses have applied now. So we'll, you know, we'll find out what happens with that. But it, if some, you know, if the easier way, the much easier way, and mind you, the cities are not asking for all of this money. You know, we're not even asking for the amount of money that proportionally would correspond to us based on population. You know, I think the, the, the last ask was 132 million of the 474 million for cities to be distributed to cities. And with that money, for us to be able to now institute programming, which supports our residences and our businesses the way that they're asking. And why, you know, why is that important? This isn't a political struggle. I don't care. I don't want to administer this money. It's, it's, it's more work for the city. We don't need to. But the thing is, we can get that money where it's needed much, much faster. I'll give you an example. You know, I set up last week when I found out the county wasn't going to give us essentially any money. I set up a very small grant program for small businesses saying to our restaurants, look, if you want to improve your outdoor dining spaces to make them safer for COVID dining or, 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 or larger so you can handle more customers because you're only allowed to do outdoor dining. That's Carlos Jimenez said you can't, you know, if you're safe, you can't have indoor dining. So Carlos Jimenez decides no indoor dining for our restaurants. Okay. We got it. We got to help our restaurants. So I set up a grant saying, look, if you want to do the outdoor dining, we'll give you, you know, a few hundred or thousand dollars, the city will to improve your spaces. Already, I've got, you know, a handful of applications, the majority of our restaurants, and this week, we're going to distribute that money to them. You know, it's not some sort of opaque bureaucratic process. And, you know, if, if the business owner wants to know what's going on with his grant, he can text me or text the village manager. We'll tell him where the money is and when he's going to get it. You know, that's what our businesses need right now. They don't need to be thrown into some sort of bureaucratic, you know, whirl, whirlpool to, to be thrown out or spit out who knows when or where. It's, it's just not fair in a pandemic to do that to people. And that's what the county essentially has decided to do. With regard to not eating indoors, I do see the logic behind that. I'm not sure where Dr. Fauci stands on that, I'm, but I, I do know that the idea of opening your mouth, sitting, you know, close to other people and having, you know, I don't know. This, I Look, I'm, not, I'm not argue, you know, I'll never make an argument on the science of trying to improve things here, but what I do want to do is help our residents and our yeah. businesses, you know, to, to, to weather this very, very long storm. No, I hear you, and I'm glad. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you're you're making these points. Yeah, I kind of want to capture your help. point. Of view. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't. It doesn't help to point them in the direction of, of a, some sort of bureaucratic, uh, uh, you know, bureaucratic whirlpool, so to speak, and and throw them in there and say, "Good luck," you know, sink or swim. That that's not what I want to do to my residents. Yeah. 
Yeah, loud and clear. And insofar as Tallahassee goes, I, I, I hear you, no legislator has the power to um, summon either the Senate. Uh, Tallahassee uh, was a mess before the pandemic. You know, it's, it's really no surprise that, that you know, the, that nothing substantial has come out to help a place like North Bay Village or even Miami-Dade County, because we've always been, all we are is the piggy bank, you know, for right. the state of Florida. Yeah, right. it's, it's always been that way. You know, as long as our legislators set legislature is set up the way that it is, it'll probably continue, and we just do the best we can. You know, we pay our tithe to to Tallahassee. You know, if you want to talk about Tallahassee, you know, if you can see on my map, we have two broken drawbridges on either side of North Bay Village. You know, we're we're stuck between two drawbridges that haven't been looked at in in years. You know, in the meantime, in Tallahassee, you know, they're funding multi multi million or billion dollar toll roads to nowhere. You know, I'd like them to come fix these state yeah. roads. They come in and out of North Bay Village. That, that's what I'd like to see. Loud and clear. And I'm just wondering at what time does the citizenry get fed up, you know, uh, with special interests? Uh, at what time, what, at when do we break this partisan divide? How, how do we get through this? Oh yeah, they're they're already they're already fed up. The problem is that people don't really, you know, they they, they really only see the government that's in front of them. And so, you know, this is a catch-22 of, of, of being, you know, a, a mayor who's front and center, right? Because people look and say, okay, fix this, fix all the problems. You know, I don't have the resources or the wherewithal to fix all their problems. Many of these are not local problems. But the thing is, everyone else is hiding behind a tree. You know, we're lucky we have Greco, you know, Representative Greco and, and Senator Pizzo who don't do that. But the problem is when you put yourself out in front, people also blame you for everything that's wrong. And we have these bureaucrats, you know, uh, in the county in, in Tallahassee sort of collecting the money and then, and then running away. You know, we need to work for the people, but, you know, it's, it's very, very difficult. You know, the, the key again, it comes down to education. You know, you're a professor. I was about to, I was about to go back to you on that one. Literally, I was, yeah. that was my, the next word out of my mouth. It goes back to education. It yeah. absolutely does, doesn't you know, the it? First, the first thing you got to understand if you want stuff from your government is how does your government work? You know, you got to yeah. spend just a little bit of time but with the political discourse that we have, you know, you just got one person blaming another and you just, people just kind of decide based on political party whose fault is it. So that doesn't work too well. Uh, this has been a really wonderful conversation. I know I've taken more time than you were supposed to give me. I just, uh, I just want to end with a, a couple of questions if I could. The first one is what lessons, um, you know, you've gone through a lot of it, but just if you could distill, like, what lessons have we learned? You know, um, I'm so happy that you, I, I'm usually the guy that brings up the climate change issue, but of course, a, a mayor at sea level surrounded by seawalls uh, probably has a, a pretty profound understanding of the existential crisis his city is in and the tax base that um, he sits on, because the second the psychology of the market goes away, there goes everything. So I, I, I way before the waves arrive, you know, when, when like hurricane insurance, um, you know, storm surges, flood insurance. Um, you know, so, so you better than I know that. So um, there's going to be future um, human caused suffering, um, like a pandemic is a humanly caused action when we deforest wilderness and then we take animals that were supposed to be in contact with us and they do because of our globalization. Um, just like that there's going to be more pandemics as Miami gets hotter and hotter and the vectors of disease come from points south to the tropics, the new tropics called Miami. Um, are there any lessons that um, we haven't solved them but have we, have we learned some lessons on how we begin to rebuild when we get out of this and are those lessons going to stick? Not from what I've seen. Yeah. I can give you, I mean, I can give you more detail. I, I don't, you know, I, I, I should have, I could have sent you, you know, if I know you were an, an artist, I would have sent you a, a little poem that I wrote, you know, about the pandemic. Do you, you know, have it? Do you have it accessible? Yeah, to I'll, I'll send it to you after, you know, and, and, and I said, you know, I shared it with my constituents. The, the, the premise is that the pandemic is a mirror. Right. And so it shows you who you are and everyone's a different person. Right. So if you if you're a person who's a forward thinker and someone that wants to prepare for the future, this has made you more inclined to do that. But if you're the opposite, if you're someone that didn't want to prepare for the future, it made you more inclined to only think about today. You know, if you were a good person, it's made you a, you know, a better, more caring person. If you were a bad person, this has brought out your worst qualities in the extreme. 
And, you know, that, that's sort of what I, what I figured out because it, it, people start, you know, I remember in March, everyone's like, yeah, you know, the pandemic's going to make everyone better. It'll make us all, you know, that, that's not happening. You know, it's, it's it, it made some people better. It made a lot of people, you know, the people that were already nasty, it makes them nastier, you know, and worse. So, you know, is it, are we going to plan more for tomorrow? You know, it just depends. You know, do we have the political willpower to do it? So far, you know, we really don't. Um, but I think that you have, you know, you have to look for leaders that are willing to overcome some really loud voices, you know, who are kicking and screaming the whole way, because I can't show people what this city's going to look like from flooding in 15 or 20 years in a way that's going to convince everyone, because you're always going to have skeptics, you know, you either have to do it or you have to not do it. And I, I feel comfortable enough to stake you know, what I'm doing politically on the fact that this is the right thing to do for the long term. You know what? Look, you know, our political system, the whole issue with our democratic political system is that it's impossible. It's very, very hard. Not impossible. It's very, very hard to work long term because right, I can't, right. you know, the results of the work that I do today that are geared for 20 or 30 or 40 years down the road, I'm not going to be around as mayor to say, look what, you know, look what we created for you. And it, trying to do it creates a heck of a lot of political friction for me. You know, so the easiest thing for me to do is just stick my fingers in my ear and pretend like I don't know what's going to happen. You know, but that's not the right thing to do. And it's not a useful, it's not a useful uh, thing for me to do a, a, as mayor if I want to improve the city. You know, and so I, I personally, I'm not willing to do it. But, you know, as a politician, man, that is the hard fight to fight because there's really, you know, it's, you're, you're fighting on two fronts. You really are. So what when I'm I say, you, you know, are we going to do it? You know, we got to have a heck of a lot of political will to do it. And we are not united, you know, locally at the state level or at the national level in a way that allows politicians to have the political capital to think long term. We're just not. And, and here we are back at education again. Right. Yeah, yeah, we are indeed, sir. In fact, for most of my practice is uh, social practice. And what I'm trying to do is not change policy. It's just make a more engaged, educated citizen so that you have the constituents who reward you, not for not in two and four year election uh, cycles, but because of what you will do uh, for their grandchildren and great grandchildren. Mm -hmm. And if we could build a society that thinks that way, and that's what I, I like, I was one of those guys who thought the pandemic was gonna take us there. And I mean, I'm good to press pause here and let you find your poem, because I'd love for you to read it. If you can't, then I'll just post it, but I would really love to, to read well, your poem. I'll send it, yeah. Read it to you because I'm not a performer, performance artist. Okay, you'll just send it and then I'll, I'll put it on my, I'll put it on my, on, on the page where this video is. But thank you so much uh, for doing that. Um, and the last thing I, I wanted to, um, unless you have anything else to talk about, that I was just going to ask you to, just um, and you have a, a many platforms and you've been doing it via text and in person with your with your residents and through your media channels, but. I just wanted you to end this this conversation, not uh, talking to me, but just talking to your constituents. And just at this point in time, at, uh, today on um, the 4th of August, uh, where if we're not at 1,700 deaths in Miami-Dade County, we're, we're pretty close. Last night, we were um, just at the cusp of 1,700 deaths. For you just to give your residents, first of all, I, um, I, I just met you, but I, I, I'm so um, um, happy to have, and I'm so inspired by your words and your way of thinking. In many ways, uh, I think uh, a parallel mind. So uh, thank you. It's, it's, really, uh, it's really inspiring to have people in public service like you. And I guess it helps that you kind of care about the stuff, otherwise you wouldn't have been in West Africa and in Central America. But I, um, I wanted to um, just give you an opportunity to end this conversation uh, with, uh, with a message to your constituents about this moment and how you're gonna help them get through it or whatever you wanna tell them about, about this pandemic. No, I mean, my, the constituents know, you know, we've been here every step of the way and that's, that's the, the first thing you gotta be is, is around, you know, as a, as a local leader or as a politician at any level. You know, and I think the second thing you know, that, that people understand, our constituents understand, you know, it's the level of empathy that we have for, for individuals. You know, everyone's life is different. Everyone's facing different problems and everyone deals with it differently. 
But, you know, I, I do believe that individuals can and should depend on their government at all levels to help them solve their problems. You know, so they need to be able to reach out and, and get a response from the government, you know, to the extent that we can, that we help solve these problems and these needs where they are. And the problems and needs, you know, that, that need to be solved at the low level have always been there, but they're more urgent and imperative today than they ever have been. So, you know, here we are, you know, we're here to help the best we can. We don't have magic wand but we certainly will work as hard as we can to support constituents and what they need, you know, in these very troubled times. Well, thank you, Mayor Levin. I, I still look forward to getting to know you better and, and congrats on everything you're doing for your city. My pleasure. Stay safe and healthy, okay? Have a great day, we'll talk soon. Bye-bye.